Eagles Entertainment. The journey to the draft is driven by AAA. AAA roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and Look, this has been a tough week if you're a fan of college football, right? If you're a fan of college sports and just all the news that has broken over the last week um, with, you know, the outlook for the 2020 season. It's now uh, 3.34 on Tuesday afternoon as I record this. Uh, the Big Ten, who we are covering today on the podcast, the top NFL draft prospects in the Big Ten, our plan was to cover who those top players are, and we did. Dane Brugler, Ben Fennell, and I, we went through uh, position by position all the top players coming out of this conference. But a couple hours after we finished recording, the Big Ten came out and announced that they are essentially canceling the 2020 football season in Big Ten. Now, they are going to hope to push to the spring what the outlook is for that in terms of how many of the players that we talk about in today's episode are going to play in the spring. Look, that remains to be seen. The other aspect of this is that Again, as it's now 334, Nebraska has already come out basically saying how disappointed they are. Uh, We've seen rumors and whispers of uh, other teams in the conference that have already said, you know what, maybe we'll look at other options. So maybe they play this season as an independent or they join another conference uh, as an affiliate just for this season only. There's a lot that still needs to be decided. As we've said on this show uh, over the last few weeks, because we've done these conference previews, a lot, so much still up in the air. But if you're a fan of the game, if you're a player or a coach, obviously, but essentially all of us that are fans of the college football game, it's just a, it's been a disappointing uh, few weeks, to say the least, uh, just in terms of where things are right now uh, with how much time there was to prepare. Um, but look, Big Ten, top prospects coming out. You got Ohio State, you got Penn State, Michigan, so many talented teams in this conference. Got a lot of players to hit on, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Myself, Dane Brugler, Ben Fennell, it's time for Draft Buzz. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, well, let's start actually talking about these players as we provided the context earlier. Uh, we have no idea where, what the status is going to be of the Big Ten by the time this episode is even released as it seems to change uh, on the hour, every hour. Guys, uh, look, a lot of players that we're going to talk about today, uh, a couple of elite level prospects, and one of whom, made himself available for the 2021 draft officially last week, declaring and saying he was going to opt out of 2020. And that's Penn State linebacker Micah Parsons. I know he was the top prospect uh, for two of the three of us. And really, I would say the three of us. All three of us kind of agree Parsons might be the best overall player, uh, regardless of position in this conference. Dane, uh, I'll let you kick things off here with the very talented former Penn State linebacker. Yeah, Parsons can do everything you want at the linebacker position, uh, from his instincts to his tackling skills. uh, He's got all the traits that you want. Uh, As an athlete, that's where he's most impressive. 6'3", 245 pounds. The pursuit speed's outstanding. Uh, Sideline to sideline range. He's twitchy. He's explosive. Um, He can give blockers a slip and uh, just close to the ball carrier like it's nothing. I mean, watching his uh, Memphis tape from last year, in the bowl game, 14 tackles, three tackles for loss, two forced fumbles. And this guy was everywhere. Uh, and he just has a knack for making plays. Uh, and it's funny because this guy was a pass rusher in, in high school. Um, you know, listening to uh, Ross Tucker had a uh, interview with uh, Coach Franklin uh, earlier this summer talking about uh, Parsons. And Franklin literally said that he's he's hasn't even scratched the surface uh, of what he can do because he never played linebacker before uh, he uh, arrived at Penn State. He was always a pass rusher, and so that's where you and you see that with his blitzing ability and his speed off the edge, um, ability, ability to make plays in the backfield. Uh, but he could be so much better than he is right now at linebacker, which is scary considering uh, how good he was on a sophomore film. So. Uh, you know, he is a legitimate, I think, one of the best top talents in this draft class. Uh, like you said, he's already declared. He's already said he'll be part of the 2021 class, which we expected. Uh, it's unfortunate we'll get to see him, uh, you know, in the fall. But who knows what college football we're going to see in the fall. So, uh, without a doubt, Micah Parsons is one of the best talents in the country. 
Yeah, I think that's so important to note his pedigree because this was the number two defensive end in the class a couple years ago. Massive player, but in combination, freak athleticism. He's the size of Leighton Vander Esch with the speed of a Jalen Smith. It's really kind of funny to compare both those Cowboy linebackers. But the first thing I see on tape, the size, the speed, the instincts, the ability to play fast with his eyes up constantly. It's like he's locked onto the ball carrier and can see the action in front of him. Like Dane mentioned, all those dipping and slipping of blocks while he has his eyes up, triggering downhill, moving moving laterally. And then obviously all these numbers on the freak list the past two years from the strength, but the agility, the 4-4-3-40, the 4-2-4 pro agility drill. This is really entering kind of Derek Johnson level uh, type of metrics as far as testing the way he did off the field uh, coming out of the University of Texas about 10, 15 years ago. But really impressive player that is re- really only a one-year starter at off-ball linebacker. It was really more of a part-time player his first year. So this is a one-year player, and sometimes those could be a bit of boom or bust. But he's done a lot well in that one year, loading up the stat sheet, 14 TFLs, five sacks, four forced fumbles, which you love to see a linebacker that gets to the ball carrier with aggression and physicality and gets that ball out and easily made the All-American list by pretty much everybody. So showed us a lot to like in that first year for him. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. You guys have hit on a lot of it. I think when you look at his potential, uh, obviously sky high, right? I mean, he, he'll, he'll get a little bit nosy in the run game at times, and he was kind of responsible for, for giving up uh, some X plays in the run game, at least, you know, just from my own analysis. You know, I, I don't know for sure uh, if that would be the case, but the way I kind of saw it, I thought he kind of got out of his gap a little bit here and there. But even when he does see things a little bit slow, that athleticism allows him to overcome that. I mean, he's just such an explosive powerful athlete uh i thought it was really interesting uh bruce feldman in the freak list in 2019 had a staffer on you know a guy that works for penn state compare him to saquon barkley just from an athletic standpoint um you know i talked with ross tucker a couple years ago when uh when micah parsons jumped on on this podcast and ross said yeah he's like lavar arrington a former teammate of mine uh and a guy obviously that started penn state was the number two overall pick uh to washington so i, I think when you look at micah parsons all the athleticism in the world, all the physical tools you want. It's a matter of just making sure that he can kind of put it all together. If he's in a pure run and chase role on the weak side for an NFL team, I mean, he's going to, he's going to put up monster numbers. And he, well, Fran, just to put you on the spot for a second, because he seems to be described similarly to Kenneth Murray coming out of Oklahoma last year, similar size, height, weight, speed, also a sub rusher. Where do you maybe see the difference in the two? I think the difference is, is that, uh, is that Kenneth Murray would be your field general guy making all the calls. He did that right away as a 17-year-old for Oklahoma. From what I understand, I don't think Parsons is going to be that guy for an NFL defense. I don't think he's going to be the guy making the calls in the huddle, um, you know, which affects his value for sure, um, you know, just in my opinion. And I think when you're talking about what is he in coverage, uh, you know, obviously Kenneth Murray didn't put up a ton uh, in terms of playing in reverse. Parsons you know, will come into the NFL draft. Uh, with five pass breakups and no uh, interceptions on his resume. So um, certainly some similarities. I think Parsons is certainly a little bit more of an explosive athlete and a little bit of a better blitzer than Murray was. Um, But I think it's an interesting comparison for sure. Where, Where do you fall on it? Yeah, I think that's all fair. You know, I think uh, Kenneth Murray was just a little bit more natural as an off-ball player, but similar usage, the way he's tighter to the line of scrimmage on those third downs, a lot more moving forward than retreating. I think Parsons did drop in that Tampa two hole quite a little bit at Penn State going backwards there. But I had a scout friend tell me halfway through the season that said, buyer beware. I wrote down a lot of similar things to Jared Davis coming out of Florida. And he's had some issues kind of finding that spot with the Detroit Lions. Another guy, similar height, weight, speed type of player, probably more of a sub rusher on third down, but has just struggled to find his way as an off ball linebacker in the NFL. And that's always kind of left, you know, a lasting impression in my head. And I just wrote that note down that somebody told me. I don't necessarily see it, but there has been players with this style that have struggled in the NFL. Sure. No question. I think that's all fair. Real quick, one other thing, uh, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about this, but just in terms of being one of the best talents in this class, uh, is is an off-ball linebacker like Parsons? Is he is he worthy of a of a top five pick, top seven pick? You know, we kind of had this discussion a little bit with Isaiah Simmons last year, but you know, if he does say he does grade out as one of the top talents, is the positional value still there to be drafted as such? 
I think that we have this discussion a lot, but in the last few years, like we saw Isaiah Simmons go top 10 last year. Uh, we saw Roquan Smith go, Devin White, Devin Bush the year before that. Um, you know, Leighton Vander Esch went in the, in the, the what, the mid-teens, late teens. Well, I think if you get a Luke Keekley, nobody complains looking right. back. But yeah. like you mentioned, there's a lot of other, other types of talent that end up going in the top 10. I do think, though, the, the big difference with some of those guys, like for sure with Devin White, with Devin Bush, with, um, you know, with a few of those guys that I mentioned, they were the field generals. They were the guys that made the calls in the huddle and got the defense set. Um, so that, that is a little bit of a difference when you're talking about some of those guys. Not all of them were, but I think – Well, this is a one-year starter. I'd like to go back and look at how many yep. of those players are essentially one-year products. Now it was an impressive year. It might be the Ro- best year at anybody. Maybe Roquan. Roquan was only a one-year guy, right, at Georgia? Yeah, um, yeah he might have been a one-and-a-half. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. i got to look back. I'd have to look back at that. But, um, no, he's going to be a fascinating player to, to study for sure moving forward uh, and just kind of gauge what his value will be. To me, the, the guy that has a chance to go ahead of him, even though he may not grade out as well, is the quarterback, Justin Fields, from Ohio State. And you talk about another guy, a one-year player, one-year starter uh, for the Buckeyes, played all you know every game for the Georgia Bulldogs the year before as a backup to Jake Fromm. But I think when you're looking at Justin Fields, there's a lot to like, right? I mean, he's 6'3", 225 pounds. Um, I think he was a twitchy athlete that had the ability to escape the rush, uh, strong enough to fight through contact. There were a few really impressive plays where, you know, a, a defender is able to get to him clean and he's able to kind of shake him off, keep his eyes downfield, no panic, and deliver the football. Throws a nice tight ball and the ball looks good coming out. He's a tough kid, kind of what like we talked about with Trey Lance, but he finishes like every run that, that uh, when he takes off uh, and makes plays outside the pocket. Yeah, that's the big thing, though, is that I mentioned that, that twitch to be able to escape. Him outside the pocket, like, yeah, he can make plays with his legs, but I was impressed with his ability to make plays with his arm outside the pocket and make those off-platform throws with really impressive accuracy and ball placement. The thing with me, though, with Justin Fields, is that he just doesn't have a great feel for playing in the pocket yet. He'll drift a little bit too often. We'll try and escape via the back door. He'll drop his eyes a little bit too often. Took a lot of sacks last year. Um, doesn't always look comfortable going through progressions. And he, he's not an anticipation thrower yet. But the thing is, is that and we talked about this a lot. There are a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL, the, the young quarterbacks that come in with those flaws that come in and make big plays. I mean, I could, all those things that I just said about, you know, the drifting in the pocket and dropping his eyes and not an anticipation thrower, I could say that about Russell Wilson when he first got in the league, Deshaun Watson right now, Josh Allen right now. Like, so, there's so many great players uh, that are making plays that are starting quarterbacks in the league that are finding a way to kind of, go, you know, get away from those issues. And I think a lot of that has to be – has to do with, uh, you know, coaching staffs, coaching around that stuff. But – Guys, I mean, I, I look at Justin Fields and say, yeah, like check the box with physical talent. And then it's a matter of, to me, it's a matter of like, does he, as it always is with quarterback, does he have those off field traits to be able to, you know, lead the room and carry the room and all that to get, gain the respect of his teammates? Because if he has all of that, all the flaws that I talked about, I think are, can get masked in today's NFL. Obviously, he'll need the right situation. But uh, to me, like, I, I liked what I saw from Justin Fields. I wrote down uh, Dak Prescott as a comparison. I think that they're very, very similar, especially looking at him coming out of Mississippi State. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Fran. And I think that, you know, to your point about, uh, you know, the physical talent is there, but it's kind of everything else. To me, where I was most impressed with watching him was just his confidence, he, he plays so calm, so cool, uh, so unforced with his movements, with his decisions. Uh, he doesn't really play panicked. Uh, so I think that innate confidence that he offers, I think that really uh, accentuates his natural talent, and it allows him to unlock all of those physical traits and be productive. So um, I, the other thing I do want to say about Justin Fields, and this is where I struggled with him, is I was more impressed with Ryan Day than I was with Justin Fields when I got done with Justin Fields tape. And that's nothing against Justin Fields. It's more, I think more says, says more about Ryan day and how impressive uh, his offense is, his scheme, the offensive system. It's just so impressive from the play call to the play design to the timing and everything. But Justin Fields, the way he uh, was able to be the point guard of that offense was really, really impressive. Uh, so, you know, I, I think he needs to get better. You mentioned being a better anticipation thrower. Um, I, I think in terms of threading the, threading the needle, we didn't see a lot of examples. Uh, and I think that goes back to Ryan Day's offense and how effective it was. Uh, but we didn't see him having to thread the needle very much on his tape. 
Uh, but he was a very good point guard for that offense, and I think he can be at the NFL level. Yeah, yeah Dane, you're literally reading the notes right off my sheet here. That offense was fantastic last year for Ohio State and much different than the previous offenses with Dwayne Haskins and some of those guys. A lot more under center elements, a lot more multi-tight end elements. I really like some of the play designs, some of the run action, getting him outside the pocket by design. And like you had mentioned, the confidence, but I wrote, just wrote down poise. And I see a lot of similar things. Maybe it's just a bit of recency bias that we saw from Jalen Hurts, not only at Alabama, but at Oklahoma as well. I think Justin Fields is maybe just a little bit twitchier of an athlete. And uh, Jalen Hurts is probably a little bit more can run between the tackles and take on a guy like a Kenneth Murray down at the goal line. But similar type of players, when you start to see the bullets flying and getting pressured, the poise, the confidence, the athleticism, just the willingness to extend the play, keep his eyes up. He clearly has that kind of X factor, that leadership and that confidence, like you mentioned. Yeah, there's a lot to like uh, with Justin Fields. Certainly some areas that I would like to see him clean up and hopefully we'll, we'll get a chance to see that. Uh, here this fall, but a really fun player to be able to evaluate on film for a number of different reasons. Guys, I think we can agree that Parsons and Fields, probably the, the shoe ins to go one, two out of this conference when it's all said and done in the draft. But I want to transition now to the senior class, uh, starting on offense. Dane, I'll go to you first. Who was the top senior that you studied in the Big Ten this year? Pretty clearly for me, it was Rashawn Slater from Northwestern, um, yeah, the left tackle, one of the few players. Uh, that I saw handle um, uh, Chase Young uh, when they w did battle. Uh, really aggressive mindset, forceful hands. Uh, his approach is really, uh, really impressive. He, he stays balanced uh, in his movements, and he, and he goes and, and gets after it. Um, and so you see him in the run game. You see him in the pass. Uh, with his pass sets, he stays square. He's got an eager punch, physical hands. Um, it just all comes back to that aggressive approach. I think that really helps him. Uh, handle speed, handle power, whatever type of uh, rusher he's facing, uh, he has something where he can uh, combat that. And it, he's going to get dinged throughout the process because he's a little undersized. Um, now he's, he's got shorter arms. I would guess he probably has under 33-inch arms. And for a lot of teams, that's a benchmark. And so it's going to be interesting to see, okay, does that automatically make him a guard or a center for that team? Or will they give him a shot outside of tackle? I, I think based off his tape, I'm keeping him at tackle, seeing what he can do. Uh, he's got experience at right tackle and left tackle. Uh, he's very efficient. Um, I, he needs to fine-tune some of the uh, aspects of his technique and uh, things like that. But this is a player that's a future starter. His dad played in the NBA. He was known for his physical dunks uh, for a lot of years. So not a surprise that you know Slater, you see that aggressive approach. Um, I would not be surprised at all when it's all said and done, this Slater ends up being a first round pick. Wow. It, it might not be a, a, as a tackle for everybody, mm -hmm. but I think he has that type of ability. I mean, to your point, like the guy that I wrote down after watching him was Lakin Tomlinson, who snuck into the first round as a guard. And, it's, you know, he, he failed in his first spot, but uh, turned into a solid starter, uh, you know, by the time we've gotten to this point in his career. I think when you look at, at Slater, Really, you mentioned really heavy hands, like, you know, consistently able to kind of jar the opposing defensive lineman on contact. I know I've talked with a couple of guys, former teammates and opponents who have talked about just how violent and heavy his hands are. Um, jumps out of his stance, kind of impressive explosiveness uh, coming out of his stance. But I just thought, you know, from a technique standpoint, uh, certainly, is, uh, you know, uh, a lot left to be desired. I thought that he really struggled to redirect against inside moves. I thought he left that B-gap open way too often. And I just like to see him get stronger. He's powerful, but he can get overwhelmed a little bit by bull rushes. So I, I think that, I, to me, I saw a little bit more of a guard just because uh, of that lack of length, that, you know, that inconsistency of being able uh, to kind of hold his own for dealing with length on the perimeter. I, I kind of like Slater, but again, you made a good point. The versatility, I think, is going to serve him really well. If he's a guy that uh, obviously has experience playing both tackle spots, if he then shows the ability to slide into guard, uh, that will serve him well early in his career while he kind of develops. Uh, you know, in the background. Uh, ben, have you done Slater? And I know you wanted to, to move, uh, continue on the offensive line as well for your pick. Yeah, I have some minimal notes with Slater. I saw him once last year against Michigan State. I just noted the left and right side experience. No sacks allowed last year. I have a note here, aggressive demeanor, can struggle against some inside moves and some twitch. But I think there's good four, five, six 
Big Ten tackles that are in this kind of day two conversation, which they could have used as 2020 to send themselves into the first round or potentially, you know, uh, dip out into day three. And whether that's Rashawn Slater, Alaric Jackson at Iowa, maybe a Thayer Munford at Ohio State. But I was really interested in this Wisconsin left tackle, Cole Van Lannen, who's really just a one year starter at left tackle, was a rotational player before that. But this is a guy who's a very powerful run blocker, fires off the ball extremely well. And that does a number of things for him he could shock defensive linemen with that initial surge he could really get up to the second level he can reach and scoop block when he needs to really gain some ground laterally they do a lot of gap and power schemes I studied Jonathan Taylor last year but didn't make a whole lot of notes about their offensive line and going back and watching Cole Van Landen was really impressive particularly in the run game now the issue with his game is he struggles going in, in reverse some of those vertical sets just is some of these awful quick sets where he gets beat immediately at the line of scrimmage I just think he's going to struggle out on the perimeter in the NFL but with his pedigree and run blocking his lack of length I think maybe he'd be a little bit more suited to slide inside at the next level maybe being a guard at 6'5 315 so that's more of my just personal projection right now I love him in the run game just too many issues in pass pro right now but I think there's a number of tackles in the Big Ten particularly this year that are right hanging in that day two conversation that with a strong 2020 maybe could have moved themselves up into the first round go ahead I said real quick on Van Lanner I think that's he is the perfect example of a guy that really needs a 2020 season to show that he can make key improvements because based off of last like when we saw him as a sophomore uh, we started to write his name down and say okay this is a guy to watch for the future then we watch him last year as a junior and I'll tell you what I gave him an undrafted grade based off of last year but you do see a few things that he can get better at and that's something that now in 2020 with you know the season up in the air we just don't know if we're gonna be able to see him on the field it's so important for a player like this to have that senior year. You know, we had Joe Burrow tweeting about how it, without his senior year, he's probably looking for a job right now. And, you know, who knows where he'd be. And so I think not having that senior year is going to hurt a lot of players if that's what it comes to. And I think Van Lannan's a perfect example of that. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about the guys at the top of the draft or mid round picks, I mean, guys are, guys are going to be affected if there's no uh, college football this season, for sure. Um, Guys, I, I'm going to be honest. I kind of struggled with the senior class in the Big Ten, both on offense and on defense, in terms of, like, top end, like, blue chip talent. We talked about a lot of seniors the last couple of weeks in both those conferences that we did in the Pac-12 and the ACC and thought, like, man, like, all right, like, these guys have a shot to go, you know, top 50, top 75. And I, I didn't quite feel that strongly about uh, some of the guys that we saw, you know, in, in this conference. To me, I, I went with the Iowa wide receiver, Amir Smith-Marset. And to me, it's because, He's got that, that X factor. He's got that speed. You know, he can be a factor down the field, 6'1". He's sub-190, a little bit lean. But I'll tell you what, he's a pretty good vertical route runner. He understands how to use his speed. He'll sell double moves really well. But overall, just using his eyes and shoulders to kind of create uh, some separation, get defenders turned around. I thought he did a, a pretty solid job of doing that. The, he fought the ball a little bit downfield. So you're going to get one of those things. He's one of those guys where – yeah, you're going to get some some flops. You're going to get some drops, but you're also going to get the big play on the back end of it, not only on offense, but also as a kick return. He brings immediate value as a specialist uh, in the kick return game. So uh, you're talking about a guy who knows how to reach the end zone a number of different ways. I, I was pretty impressed with Amir Smith, Marcet. I talked to a couple of his teammates this offseason, and they all thought, yeah, he, him and Rondell Moore are going to be the most explosive playmakers in the Big Ten this year. Obviously, uh, we'll talk about Rondell Moore here in a little bit, but he has already declared – for the 2021 draft. Smith Marset will get will continue to see. But I, I thought to me, he had the most upside of the guys in the senior class on the offensive side of the ball. I'm not sure if any of you guys uh, or if either of you guys have watched uh, Amir Smith Marset. Yeah, in speed is what you mentioned and how important that is. And that that's his game. Um, and I, I think that he is he's worthy of the conversation here because talking to just you know my casual conversations with scouts throughout the summer. He has third and fourth round grades uh, throughout the league as one of the top five to seven senior receivers in this draft. So um, at least at this point in the process. So definitely a guy we're talking about as a, as a high upside speed guy who has a place in the league. 
Yeah, I think that's really fair. I mean, he averaged 16 yards a catch on 44 catches, has the inside-outside versatility, can play in the slot, dynamic in the return game. He also had 11 carries for 100 yards and three touchdowns. I like seeing just a little bit of creativeness in that Iowa offense as well, maybe stretching the defense horizontally as well with some toss sweeps and some jet action uh, to the speedy kid. But there's a lot of kids in the Big Ten that are kind of in this Jack of all trades, gadget speed, whether it's Wap Filer at uh, Indiana or Rondell Moore or even the young kid like Wandale Robinson at Nebraska. A lot of fun players in that 6'1", 180, a little undersized, but can do a lot with that speed. Yeah, no question. Well, let's stick at the wide receiver position here, guys, as we transition to our most intriguing underclassmen on offense. And, uh, you know, we've already talked about Michael Parsons, who opted out of the 2020 season. I alluded to Rondell Moore from Purdue, who opted out for 2020. We haven't talked yet about Minnesota wide receiver Rashad Bateman. Ben, I know he is your pick for your most uh, intriguing underclassman on offense. Yeah, Rashad Bateman, a true junior out of Minnesota, 6'2", 210, third-team All-American last year, first-team Big Ten, prolific season with 60 grabs, 1,200 yards, 11 touchdowns off of a pretty impressive true freshman season, setting the school record in receptions and yards. Tyler Johnson was going to be gone in 2020. It was kind of going to be his show uh, to get a lot of the production in the offense, but obviously opted out and declared for the draft already. He's a little bit more polished than some of these other receivers, in my opinion. I think he's a little bit more nuanced to his game than maybe a Devontae Smith or uh, even a Jalen Waddell down there at Alabama. Really dynamic route runner. I think he has some physical and athletic limitations, but I tend to like these guys a little bit more because they know that. They need a dynamic release package. They know how to attack leverage. You have to be sharp in and out of breaks. You have to restack vertically. Not crazy explosive, but I think that's okay because this is the same type of 4-5-5, 4 receiver that produces Michael Thomas's and Devontae Adams and Michael Crabtree's and DeAndre Hopkins of the world, where I kind of like that little lack of 4-4 because you need to know how to get open. And this guy rolls off the line of scrimmage quick head still his first three four steps Fran on a consistent basis I have no idea where his routes are going very polished player and despite not having that maybe top end speed he led the Big Ten last year in downfield receptions with 14 and who was second Tyler Johnston with 13 this Minnesota team liked to air the ball out throw it deep he was also the most targeted downfield. That's more than K.J. Hamler or Chris Olave at Ohio State. So he was doing something right to get himself down the field. His wide receiver coach, Matt Simon, previously at Western Michigan, booty coach, All-American Corey Davis, first-round pick in the NFL. So I really like the combination of pedigree, the coaching, his size, speed, the hands, the aggressiveness. Really interesting player. Just doesn't maybe have that top-end elite trait to get excited about. And the two names that I wrote down for Bateman, uh, Michael Thomas and Keenan Allen. Uh, now, it's not to say that he's going to have that type of career in the NFL. It's just when you talk about skill set and play style, that, that's what he reminds me of. And you mentioned a few other good names in there, Ben. It's just, you know, he – it's going to be interesting. For some teams, he might be wide receiver two in this class um, because of what they – really value at the position. But for other teams, he might be wide receiver six or seven because he's not a burner. He doesn't have that elite speed and teams might prefer that uh, from, from their receiver or the, the specific receiver that they're looking for uh, on their team and for their offense. So just a really intriguing receiver uh, who, you know, has is a bright future ahead of him because of how savvy he is. Every step has a purpose. Uh, he understands how to leverage coverage. I mean, just that understanding of how to play the position uh, is really what fuels Bateman and, and why I think he's going to be an NFL starter. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what. Like I, the one name I wrote down, uh, Ben, I wrote down Allen Robinson. You know, coming out of Penn State, you know, Robinson was 6'2", he's 220. Uh, he was a little bit of a stockier kid. But same understanding of how to attack leverage, how to hold his vertical stem, how to not tip his hand as a route runner. I agree that he's not like a burner. He's not the most like sudden or explosive or twitchy athlete, but I, I thought he at least like checked the box there. I didn't see it as like, Oh man, like I just don't know if he's got the, you know, enough athleticism to be able to separate. I, I thought he was a really good route runner, played the ball really, really well in the air. I was really, really impressed to me. Like of all the receivers we've studied so far and we've watched, we've watched some pretty, uh, you know, some really talented kids. 
I kind of liked him more than anybody so far. I, to me, like, I thought that he had the most well-rounded game uh, of all the guys that we've studied. He's a really, really fun player. I'm excited to see, uh, you know, just kind of how he's viewed and how the discussion transitions with him. Um, really, really quick, Fran, yeah, I just want to say, I was kind of just looking at his name in the mix of other receivers in this class, whether it's Devontae Smith or Jamar Chase or Tylen Wallace, Chris Olave. All those other guys get you a little bit more excited in the same way. You know, he dealt with some injuries this past year, but I'm hearing incredible things about Brian Edwards over with the Las Vegas Raiders right now. And I see a similar type of player in projection that maybe you don't get excited, doesn't have that twitch. He's not going to run 4-4 at the combine. This guy's going to show up in camp and one-on-ones and just look like he belongs and know how to get himself open. I don't want to say he's the son of a coach. I don't know where he's from, but he just has that type of – pedigree and feel to him that he's ready to go day one he may get a little bit slighted because of not having those elite traits but he does a lot of things right I mean PJ Fleck is a former receiver uh you know you mentioned that you know his staff coming from Western Michigan where they coached uh, a few guys that went on to the NFL including Corey Davis obviously a top five pick uh you met it's funny you mentioned Brian Edwards because I was thinking about him as you were talking about him I liked him and I liked Edwards and there were some people that really loved Brian Edwards in the league I liked him more. Like, I feel like he's a little bit more loose. He's got a little bit more juice to him. Uh, I'm, I'm a, he excites me. I, I like Rashad Bateman uh, with everything that he brought to the table. Uh, so, I, for mine, for most uh, intriguing underclassmen, I actually stood with the Golden Gophers. And, you know, the way that I kind of stack players, there are only a handful of, like, blue chip guys. And I felt like, man, like, this guy could be one of the best in his position in the league. Daniel Fa'alele, the right tackle for, uh, for Minnesota, really really impressive because you're talking about a guy and we talked about him earlier this summer right might have actually been in like may with eric galco and eric was right on point uh, do i look at daniel falalele at 6'9 400 pounds he is not a slug out there i mean he moved he's got fairly light feet uh absolutely unique rare size for the position but has not played a lot of football if you're not familiar with the story uh, 2017 was his first year playing football. He's from Melbourne, Australia, uh, got noticed in a, in a camp down there and got sent up. He went to IMG Academy, 2017, his first year there, basically was a water boy where he was just like learning the rules, learning how to like tie his cleats and put on his pads and like buckle the belt straps and stuff like had no idea what he was doing then, then played in 2018, got recruited and ended up uh, going to Minnesota because he thought he had offers from like everybody, but he felt most comfortable with PJ Fleck and that coaching staff. When I see a guy who's 6'9", 400, hasn't played a ton of football, but he's still able to, you know, basically give up really much of anything in terms of a pressure standpoint, completely overwhelms people at the point of attack. He's still figuring it out, but he's just so damn hard to get around. Like, he's 6'9", 400 pounds. Like, even if his technique isn't great, he still finds what, like, you talk about, like, Trent Brown and guys like that, like, in the league where, yeah, they, everything's not always perfect, but at the end of the day, He's just so damn big. Like, I just don't know how this guy's not going to be, you know, a top first, second, you know, even if he fell down to the third round, I think that would be surprising. Follow it. I don't know if people are talking about this kid from Minnesota. Yeah, no, it's, I think, you know, we, he's not quite the same prospect as Isaiah Wilson was last year uh, out of Georgia. Another, you know, young player who just had size, didn't really know what he was doing completely just yet, but still ended up going in the first round as a top 30 pick. And I'm, I'm with you. I, I think that there's a good chance that Fale can, can do the same thing because he's so just naturally gifted that, you know, it, it's we say this, you know, a lot about players, how they haven't played their best football yet. It's so true with this guy because he just started playing football yesterday. So, you know, he's <laughs> – He's so big, and he he's not going to be a top tester in terms of uh, you know the times that you usually look for uh, during you know the testing portion and the combine and workouts. But it, it, when you're watching the tape, this guy is uh, you know he just doesn't allow guys to get past him, and he should continue to grow and get better as he understands the biomechanics of uh, you know his unique frame and using his length to his advantage, things like that. So yeah, it's. He is definitely a guy on the upswing who has a chance to be one of the top three or four tackles in this class. I like him more than Zach Banner, who was a fourth-round pick. I like him more than Orlando Brown, who at 6'8", 345, was a third-round pick and looked horrible in workouts at the Combine. I see him in that day two conversation right there. My comp right now is the big show. 
uh, from WWE. I think yeah. he, if you know, with the right development, he could really end up being that type of player. Yeah, uh, let's hope so. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, he's he's just really really intriguing. Dane, I know you wanted to stay along the offensive line for your pick. Yeah, and I'm going to Columbus, where uh, I think they have one of the best interior offensive line tandems in the country. Talking about Wyatt Davis, uh, the guard, and uh, Josh Myers, the center. Uh, to me, I, Wyatt Davis is uh, the best interior line prospect that I've looked at so far. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I think it comes back to one simple thing is everything looks so natural to him. You know, it, it, everything looks effortless. And I, I think it stems from is just his ability to process. Uh, he doesn't look surprised by things. He has, uh, but, you know, when he, so he can win mentally, but physically he can win as well because he has a striking power where he can win the point of attack. He's an efficient puller. Uh, he, he can win leverage. Um, but, you know, it really all comes back to that awareness. That, that's how he gets the upper hand. So I'm a big fan of Wyatt, Wyatt Davis. And then Josh Myers, I think, is in that conversation as well to be uh, one of the top centers. He's up there with Creed Humphrey. So really uh, you know, eager to see both those guys and see how – if they can gel uh, with another year. You know, talk about Justin Fields and how, um, you know, how talented he is. He, he loses a lot on that offense. Um, talk about K.J. Hill and J.K. Dobbins and um, Austin Mack and, and uh, you know, some of the other guys that he had around him. But having that core on the offensive line, I, I think, is really going to be a, a, a comfort for him because, like, Davis and Myers – two of the best uh, prospects on the interior uh, that we have this year. So I, I went in expecting like a lot of big things from Wyatt Davis and he, he's pretty impressive in terms of like, he's a well-rounded player. Like I think he's got some natural strength. He's got some light feet. He looks good and change direction. He's a natural bender. Like there are some really good things that I like. I thought he was pretty active with his hands, but there were a lot of things too, where, too often a loud defensive lineman into his chest. He's not a power guy uh, at the point of attack right now. I didn't think that there was any like overwhelming trait where I was like, man, like he is great in this one area. And to me, like if I'm going to say, oh yeah, he's going to be in that like Zach Martin, Brandon Scherf, Quentin Nelson, like in that tier where I'm like, yeah, this guy's going to go first round. I don't necessarily know if I see that, especially from the power element in the run game, but yeah, I, I thought he was a really well-rounded player. I'll tell you what, though, man. Like, I kind of liked Josh Myers a little bit more, the center. I kind of felt that, uh, you know, his game translated pretty well. Smart kid. not he, He's kind of like Davis that he's not overly powerful, but at center that doesn't necessarily bother me as much. Just solid across the board. I, I kind of like Josh Myers, um, and maybe even a little bit more than Wyatt Davis. Interesting. And, and I think – I would agree with you. I don't think Wyatt Davis – is on the same level as Zach Martin or Quentin Nelson or those guys. I think he is more of a, you know, a late first round guy, maybe early second, somewhere in top 40 where he just projects as a, as an NFL starter, because I don't think he's going to hurt you out there. Uh, he's not an overwhelming player who's just going to bully you and bounce you around the field. Uh, but he's just, he's very sound with his, uh, you know, in terms of executing his assignments and he gets the job done. And so, uh, you know, obviously that there is a, uh, a value in being able to offer that. And, I, you know, with Myers, I, the one thing that bothered me with him is he tends to get top heavy uh, and he'd fall off some blocks. And I think he needs to just get better with his lower body bend and, uh, you know, being present in the moment and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, he was a first year starter and I think he's going to get better and better. Uh, if, if you tell me that Josh Myers is the first center drafted in, in April's draft, would not be shocked at all because he has that type of ability. Yeah, and Dane, the one thing I really want is what you wrote down for Trey Smith, the bully strength. I just want to see the finish, the, the torque, the movement, you know, and just a little bit more tenacity in his game. Right now, I like Trey Smith at Tennessee a little bit more, and Zion Johnson has done a lot to really impress me at Boston College. I think they're just kind of uh, just a notch above Wyatt Davis, in my opinion, at this point. All right, let's, uh, let's make the transition over to the defensive side, guys. We'll talk about our favorite defensive senior, uh, you know, obviously, there's, there's some options here. I would say a little bit more than we saw uh, on the offensive side. Dane, we'll come to you first. Yeah, and when I started sitting down to watch these pass rushers, um, a lot of these guys kind of left me, not maybe not a lot, but a few of them left me wanting more. Uh, you know, Gregory Rousseau, who we talked about in the ACC preview, uh, you know, really athletic, really long, but I expect a little bit more. Quiddy Pay from Michigan was the opposite, where I, I had expectations going in when I really studied him. But he exceeded them. Uh, and, you know, it, I think it comes down to that lower body twitch that he offers. And so not a surprise to see him number one 
on Bruce Feldman's freak list, uh, that, that explosive twitch. It's so clear uh, on his film. Watching him on the Iowa tape, going up against Alaric Jackson uh, and Tristan Wirfs, uh, I mean, he was getting after it. Uh, just that, that athleticism is clear. Um, he could work up and down the line of scrimmage. Not the longest guy. Um, you know, needs to get a little bit better with his counters in, in terms of his timing. But, look, this is a guy who his background is extensive. He's – uh, a refugee of the uh, Liberian Civil War, immigrated to the United States when he was one year old. Uh, you know, was a kind of a late bloomer, uh, late introduction to football uh, out of Rhode Island. I mean, how many off, how often do we hear about recruits out of Rhode Island? Uh, he might be one of the first. Uh, he signs with Michigan, and you know, we really started to see it last year where he emerged as a a one of the uh, key impact players for that defense, getting better and better. And so I. Uh, you know, Bruce Feldman's freak list, they had him listed as six, three, seven, three cone drill, which I, I, I mean, I, I some of those, there, there's some home cooking with some of those times. Six, three, seven is remarkable to put that into any type of context. Von Miller, uh, had one of the best three cone drills ever, uh, for a, a pass rusher. And he was at six, seven, oh, and uh, apparently quitting pay ran a six, three, seven, which I don't know it's humanly possible, but regardless, this is a really athletic player who is still learning uh, the art of pass rush, but I think he's getting better and better, and I, I think he still has room to grow. I, he was a guy, honestly, that grew on me, like, the more I watched. I, Danny, I watched him, like, back in, like, late May, early June, and I didn't love him. I thought, oh, oh, like, high floor. He play, He's built the same way uh, as Taco Charlton, plays the same role in the same scheme as Taco Charlton. And to me, like, I saw a lot of the same uh, worries that I had about Taco Charlton. Like, as you mentioned, like, not the most natural pass rusher yet, still kind of finding his way there. But the more I watch, number one, I saw that the movement started to show up a little bit more. Uh, those, na- those numbers there are, like, Rashawn Gary-style numbers. And I don't know that he's, like, that level of athlete. I, I don't see, like, that level, even in, like, the explosive stuff, uh, a straight line with, uh, with Quiddy Pay. Um, but you do see uh, some of those athletic those some of those athletic traits start to show up a little bit more strong than he is powerful. I thought that he held up well uh, in the run game, but just a, a really high motor kid, always chasing the football. Um, you know, he plays with really good hand placement in the run game. Heavy handed kid can jar guys back uh, on contact. I mean, the big thing is I mean, he's never had more than six and a half sacks in a season. You know, he's, he left some production on the field. He's kind of like Rousseau in that way where, um, you know, there were a lot, a lot of missed plays. And I was like, man, like the numbers could have been even better than, than what they were. Uh, but it's 6'4", 277 uh, to move the way he does. High floor is a run defender. Like I, I kind of come away saying like, all right, like it's kind of the discussion we had uh, about Boogie Basham last week where it's like, all right, like high floor is like an Alex Okafor – level of starter where he's not going to like wow you but at least like you know you're going to get confident play as a pass rusher and quality play as a run defender with okay now now what else can you give me on the back end I think he's going to earn the right to take the field on third down and get after the quarterback just because of how he plays the run and his play personality yeah I think that's all fair and a couple notes just to add to what you guys said first thing watch his bowl game against Alex Leatherwood Alabama left tackle if you want to see him against a first round NFL caliber tackle. I thought he held his own. The other thing is, he left high school at about 230 pounds, showed up to Michigan at 240. It's up to 277 right now. So he's still kind of learning his body and the weight and whatnot. And then his pedigree coming out of high school, the running back, the track speed. He won the state championship in the long jump. This is the lower body explosive player. You see that on tape with his change, change of direction with that first step. And he's on my list. I have a little side list here for guys that I predicted to have a meteoric rise in 2020 because of Mike Dana gone, Josh Uchi gone, and Don Brown's creative sub-package uh, pass rush scheme really opens up a lot of opportunities. They'll play this guy off the edge, standing up, four-point stance, slot him into three-tech, stand up, a lot of twists, stunts, games. He only had six and a half sacks last year, but with out Dana and Yuchi, I could really see him falling into maybe 10, 12 sacks uh, next season, whenever that is. And maybe even with defensive end Aiden Hutchinson, another guy who I expect to rise in that scheme. It's a really advantageous scheme for pass rushers. And I think his versatility, his strength, his athleticism, there's a lot to like there in that scheme. Yeah, I, to me, really interesting player. Guys, the, the, the player that I went with, I don't think it's better than, than Quiddy Pay. 
Uh, Shaka Tony from Penn State. I think that, you know, I just wanted to kind of bring him up so that we could talk about him. Um, you know, at 6'3", 230 pounds, very undersized for a pass rusher. And, and you know, Ben, you, you mentioned to me offline, just to kind of some of the guys that we've already talked about during these conference previews that he's very similar to, you know, the Hamilcar Rashid from um, – uh, from Oregon State, Chris Rumpf, we talked about last week uh, out of Duke, uh, D'Angelo Malone, we talked about a few weeks ago, Western Kentucky. I think when you look at Shaka Tony, he's slight, he's slender, but he's also pretty slippery. I mean, he can get out, he can <laughs> find small cracks, he can get into the backfield, make plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. He's been consistently productive, even, even as a part time player, fresh or his redshirt freshman year. He was a, a backup, he was like the fourth or fifth end off the bench. Three and a half sacks, six TFLs. The next year as a backup to Sharif Miller, seven TFLs, five sacks. Then he steps into the, onto the field last year as a starter, and he comes up with eight TFLs and six and a half sacks. So this is a guy that finds ways to make plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. There just aren't a lot of examples of him making plays at the point of attack when he's on the play side of run plays. Like, can he? how is he going to hold up against uh, double teams from a tackle and a tight end or even two tight ends? You, to me, like, that's the big question I want to see answered with Shaka Tony at his best. Like if you really, really like Shaka Tony, you're like, man, he could be, he could be Yannick Ngakwe. Like he could, he could be that kind of player, <laughs> but for every Yannick Ngakwe, there are like five or six, seven, eight, nine guys that have that build that just don't turn up. And even the uh, Yannick Ngakwe came out, he was in the two forties or low two fifties uh, at the combine. Like I said, Tony is right around two thirty. So uh, I think that that's going to be the big question. There's another DN, though, for this Penn State Nittany Lions team that uh, we're going to talk about here coming up. And, Dane, I'll let you kick things off here. For our most intriguing underclassmen on – Well, Nittany real quick, Fran, before yeah. you put Tony to bed, my, my only note or my one note I have in red and bold here is obviously all those sneaky disengage moves, the dips. But what I have in red here can get absolutely mauled if he doesn't yeah. win with quickness. Yeah. Not a guy to hold the point, hold his gap. He's going to slip. He's going to dip. He's going to shoot. But on the Michigan tape, a lot of battles against right tackle uh, Jaden Mayfield, really nice player, really the only Michigan offensive lineman returning this year, uh, a lot of seniors last year. Every couple snaps, Tony just shoots past them. But once Mayfield gets his hands on him, he'll literally run them 10, 15 yards down the field. So he makes some splash plays, but his down-to-down usage on early downs, kind of a concern. But another outside linebacker with track speed. I'd like to see Penn State linebacker room field a 4 by 100 track team with Shaka Tony and Michael Parsons and uh, another really talented defensive end out there. Yeah, and Jason Owe. And that's yeah. the guy that, Dane, I know you want to hit on here for most intriguing underclassmen on defense. Yeah, in terms of – and this conference has a few really intriguing guys on defense, but Owe, to me, is at the top of the list because he's so athletic, 6'5", 255 pounds, uh, and he's, he's a former basketball guy, and you see that in his movements. Uh, he transferred schools uh, prior to his junior year in high school, uh, and he was a basketball player. And the football coaches got one look at him and said, okay – come out for football practice and so this is a sport that he knew nothing about and he goes out and you know learns the game as a junior becomes a little more a little better as a senior and he has 20 sacks his last two years and becomes this uh, big time recruit uh Alabama Michigan Ohio State they're all coming after him he decides to go to Penn State and you know he's still he's still young I mean he only has one start in his career but with uh Yeter Gross Matos now in the NFL Owe steps into the starting role opposite uh, Tony, and uh, he's got a chance to really emerge this year. When you watch his tape, you see the athleticism, uh, how nimble he is, his first step explosion, the lateral quickness so he can work on twists. Um, he can work in space really well. Um, it, the splash plays are really awesome. It's just I, I, when I wrote my uh, pass rush uh, preview on The Athletic for the biggest thing he needs to work on, I, I talked about his pass rush construction. Uh, getting down the timing, getting down, uh, you know, the ability to win with counters, not just relying on that, that first step to, to soften the edge, understanding the pass rush sequence. And so uh, he just really needs to introduce more variety and diversity into his pass rush. And I think he can get there. It's just it, it's going to take some time uh, it, because the athletic tools, the physical tools, it, it's all there for him to be a big time prospect. Guys, like I, to me, and this might not be a popular opinion, I think he's the most gifted pass rusher we've done. I think he's more gifted than Greg Rousseau. Like I, to me, like I thought, I thought the tools for Owe 
were a lot better than what we saw from Rousseau in terms of he can be the more complete package. He can win with power. He can win with speed. Some of his rushes, I know there are some where he just relies on the athletic ability, but I see some where, like, he'll throw a little flattened step in there to, like, kind of get the tackle to open up his shoulders uh, to the field and then dip the corner and turn the edge, like, swat the hands down. He looks like Cleo Mack. You know, like, just in terms of, like, the way that he's built, the way that he can close, the power that he can play with, he could be a five-tool guy coming off the edge. Uh, His upside to me is as high as anybody that I've studied. He's a really, really fun player that has just has not, you know, played to the point where he can figure it out. I mean, he's only a redshirt freshman from what we saw last year entering his redshirt sophomore year. I would be a little surprised if he were to come out because we're talking about a guy who only has, um, you know, a handful of sacks on his resume but the tools are eye-popping. Like, really, really, really impressive kid. But I think there's a couple guys in this conference. You look at, like, who is dominating the past couple of years. You have Chase Young, Zach Bond, Epinesa, Kenny Willekes, Gross Matos, Josh Uchi. It's a huge changing of the guard for pass rusher. Someone's going to step up, whether it's Quiddy Pay, whether it's some of these young, other young guys at Michigan. Ohio State has some impressive guys behind the scenes, like a Zach Harrison that really hasn't gotten on the field a whole lot. Somebody who's going to make a name for themselves in 2020 and really uh, splash on the scene with 10, 12, maybe 15 sacks. So let's go to the secondary now. We haven't spent too much time talking about any secondary members yet. Uh, let's go with Sean Wade here, Ben, uh, you, a guy that a lot of people have locked into the first round of most mock drafts. Yeah, this is the deep cornerback group. And the more I dug into Sean Wade's uh, tape and what he's going to do at the next level, I had some more concerns than maybe I had for uh, Patrick Sertan or Caleb Fairley or even like guy like J.C. Horn at South Carolina, I think are more suited to play outside in the NFL. So let's just talk about Sean Wade for a second. He's a redshirt junior, he's essentially a two-and-a-half-year starter at Ohio State. Dane had him as his number three corner back in December. So he's a guy that's been highly touted for a while now. But this is a nickel slot defender primarily, about 80 82% in his two-year career where he's been a full-time starter there. And that has allowed Ohio State to play a lot of base defense. They always have three linebackers on the field, and Sean Wade's ability to kind of support in the run as well, being almost a pseudo strong safety, allows them to survive with some tougher corners out on the field. Now, the issue with that is some of the names I've written down off my initial watch were like Rocky Sin and Malcolm Jenkins, not really the outside corner pedigree in the NFL and maybe not even a true nickelback in the NFL, not the twitchiest type of guy, not a guy with the great long speed. And I just wonder where he's going to fit at the next level. He doesn't have the length and speed of a Jeffrey Akuda. So I just wonder, you know, where you're going to kind of play him at the next level based on where he's playing uh, his role at Ohio State. But he's a tough player. He's a versatile player. He's an instinctive player. I just wonder if he has some athletic limitations, some speed limitations that are really going to kind of uh, limit his ability to play certain spots at the NFL. So I watched him late last week. And two names that I wrote down while watching are actually former Eagles. One, a little bit of a throwback going back to like early 2000s. Uh, Bobby Taylor was a big, long, physical corner that the Eagles at that time really liked to match up with Michael Irvin. He could line up in the slot. He could line up out wide and, you know, would use his physicality to kind of beat up on guys. And I think when you look at Sean Wade, that's certainly an area that he likes to be able to win. He likes to be able to be physical. He's a, he's a reactionary athlete. He shows the ability to click and close. I do wonder if the long speed is quite good enough. I think that there are, I think that it is good enough, but I think it's like right on the verge. To me, the other name I wrote down was another former Eagle that didn't have as great a career in Philadelphia, was much better uh, at his previous stop, and that's Namdi Asuma. And Namdi was a, a late first-round pick, uh, was a, a safety at Cal that a lot of people thought was going to make the move to corner. And I think that you kind of make that same projection here with Sean Wade. He's been mostly a slot player. Can he play on the outside? He was slated to play on the outside going into this season. We'll see if, they, if they're able to get any games in, if he can show what he can do on the perimeter. If he shows that he can do that, because there were times where he was matched up outside. It was rare and few and far between on film, but you could find a few last year. You just want to be able to see him do it on a full-time basis. But to me, it wouldn't shock me if a team drafted him and said, like, yeah, like, we want to play you on the outside. It also wouldn't shock me if Ben, if they, if you, like you said, it became a safety, like in just in terms of uh, where he's going to line up in base. I think it's got a really, really interesting discussion. I think a best case scenario projection is kind of the way the role of like a Desmond King is carved out 
with the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. Really a strong safety, nickel, playing down in the box, a good run defender, but doesn't spend a whole lot of time outside the numbers, and that was really his concern at Iowa, his ability to turn and run, his long speed, things like that. So I just wonder kind of where he's going to project to the next level. And with Ohio State moving on from a couple guys on the back end, I wonder if a more true strong safety uh, role would serve him better as far as projecting to the next level. But that defense year after year has a lot of turnover. He's not going to have his buddy Damon Arnett or Kuda or Fuller back there and Chase Young's gone and Hamilton and Malik Harrison at linebacker. A lot of different bodies on that defense. So just wondering to see if they're going to move some things around in 2020. And I, so, I actually picked Sean Wade for the category we have coming up here in a little bit, you know, most approved. And so I'll just touch touch on Wade now, uh, but for a lot of the same reasons, uh, the the doubts that you guys have, that's kind of why I chose him for that category because, uh, yeah, like, along the lines of what you're saying about being uh, a guy comfortable as being an inside player play, playing in the nickel, uh, are we going to see him more outside? Are we going to see, you know, what's the position uh, versatility going to look like uh, for him? And this is a player who, he was a five-star guy. I mean, a lot of hype going to Columbus from Florida, from Sean Wade. And he did not uh, really have a great first impression. Uh, the immaturity label was attached to him very early on. Uh, you saw some lazy tendencies. You wanted to see more urgency from Sean Wade. Uh, and last year we started to see, uh, you know, the talent uh, it really come out on the field. But at the same time, you did see him, you know, if he was beat off the line of scrimmage from press, he had a tough time catching up, talking about, you know, your concerns about the long speed, Fran. Uh, you know, he's a guy that uh, is not really anticipating the routes just yet. His feet are a little undisciplined, but there's so much talent there. And he's a guy that he's good size. Uh, a little surprised that he didn't come out last year. Uh, I think a lot of people expected him to. So maybe maybe a, a little more of a mature decision um, going back to make sure he did get his degree. And he actually did uh, get his degree mm -hmm. a couple of days ago from Ohio State. So even though he's a registered junior, he will be eligible for the senior bowl. Uh, and I think that'd be a, a, an opportunity for him uh, that he should take if he is, if, is given that. So th this is why I picked Sean Wade for the most approved uh, this upcoming season. I wonder what the advisory committee gave him last year. I bet it was a grade he really didn't like and thought he could slide himself probably into round one. I bet it was a two, three type of grade. But I've had him in this list with Sertan, Horn, Fairley, Cam Bynum, Paulson Adebo, and it's like, no, 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 he's a nickel. I need to be talking about him with Javon Holland, Elijah Molden, and Kerry Vincent. It's a much different crop of players I think we need to put him in that pecking order with. And when I go with that list, I have Elijah Molden considerably ahead of him at this point as far as projecting to a true nickelback position, and that's what he's done at Ohio State. If they want to play him outside of the numbers and he ends up being this great cornerback prodigy, okay. But for some reason, he's not outside the corner, outside the number corner at Ohio State at the moment. So it's a bit of, of a projection if you want him there at the NFL. Yeah, him coming out right now would be a projection to outside corner for, uh, for sure. I mean, we haven't seen it uh, nearly enough. Um, guys, my, my pick for this category, not the guy – I don't think this guy's better than Owe or, or Sean Wade, but just a player that I like watching the more I – and I feel like he'll be a nice key cog on, an, on a defensive line in the NFL, uh, ideally one that uses a lot of different multiple fronts and can, you know, kind of move him all around like he was used in Michigan. And that's Aiden Hutchinson, uh, redshirt junior, 6'6", just under 270 pounds. And uh, this is a guy that lined up literally everywhere, you know, from zero technique, head up on the center, all the way out to like a seven or a nine technique off the edge, he'll play over tackle, he'll play over guard. Uh, he's long, he uses that length, he maximizes his frame at the point of attack, strong run defender, high effort kid, flies around the field. We've seen a lot of players go in the middle rounds uh, with this same skill set. Some guys have stuck, some guys have not, but I think that he's got the ability to stick in the league. His dad, former MVP uh, for Michigan, was a, a big time pass rusher for them year back in the early 90s uh this is a guy in hutchinson that i think has the skill set especially in today's league with all the the different fronts to really really stick and find a good home you know whether that's uh you know for a team like baltimore or one of these teams that are using like the patriot system one of these teams that they use a lot of different fronts will really find a home for this kid and really allow him to kind of maximize that skill set guys let's get to our our sleeper category here uh someone who we think is flying under the radar and ben we're going to come to you first for, uh, for our namesake player. I mean, is there one a player who's better suited to be talked about on the Journey of the Draft podcast than Penn State running back Journey Brown? 
<laughs> seems pretty suited right here and not a true sleeper if you're in any sort of Penn State message boards or anything. This is a highly touted kid that had an impressive one year at Penn State with 153 touches for over 1,000 yards, 14 touchdowns. That's seven yards per touch. Really impressive anytime he got the ball in his hands, whether in the pass game or the run game. This kid has an impressive track background. The short sprints and the 1600 meter long jumps. He won back to back state titles in the 100 meter in 2016 and 2017 for Meadville High School. Really interesting player. And just go right to that bowl game against Memphis where he had 202 yards in a variety of ways between the tackles on the perimeter, catching the football. I don't know where Penn State is finding these track kids, but somebody needs a pat on the back for their recruiting the past couple of years because they are loaded with all sorts of speed. And he just seems like the next in line from Saquon Barkley to Miles Sander and Journey Brown was going to be a redshirt junior in 2020. Absolutely eligible, only one year on the field so far, but showed up on the freak list over the summer with a 42940. And I think that's absolutely legit with these other uh, freakish Penn State players. Really fun player that I think is just a little bit under the radar with, you know, the dominant headlines of guys staying like Najee Harris and ETN in their senior years. Journey Brown needs a lot of love because he's just as good. Absolutely. And I, I received a lot of feedback uh, from uh, a lot of people when I released my running back rankings a few weeks ago and Journey Brown was number one uh, ahead of Travis Etienne, ahead of uh, Najee Harris and all these other talented running backs. I, I'm a believer in the talent. Uh, I mean, this guy, you, know, you, you spoke about his uh, sample size and I, it's, it's, it's true. He, you know, 80% of his carries last year came in the final six games. So I think we start to see it. Uh, you know, they used more of a committee backfield and then he started to kind of break, break through and be more of that workhorse. Um, and just, he was dominant down the stretch Four of his final five games, went over hundred yards rushing. He averaged 12.6 yards per rush in the bowl game was just outstanding in that one. So this is a guy that doesn't even have a thousand yards rushing in his career uh, yet. But to me, he's the best running back I've seen so far. So gifted. Um, and look at Penn State. I mean, Saquon Barkley was the first back drafted in 2018. Miles Sanders, the second back drafted in 2019. Uh, and this in this upcoming April, I think Jeremy Brown has all the ingredients, uh, both uh, or as a runner, as a receiver, as a, as a pass blocker. He, it, it'll be interesting to see what his workload is this year, um, you know, if we see him on the field. But I, I think he has all the ingredients to be one of, if not the first running back off the board. So uh, in the same vein, I, I, my pick here for this category was Ohio State wide receiver Chris Olave. You know, at 6'1", 188, even I think uh, slightly like, you know, casual fans of college football might be familiar with Chris Olave because, uh, you know, he's been, you know, the Buckeyes have been as good as they've been. He was their leading receiver last year. But guys, like we've talked about this receiving class and just how talented it is. And, you know, even compared to last year's class, you talk about, uh, you know, Jamar Chase and Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddell and Justin Ross and Rashad Bateman and Tutu Atwell and just go down the name after name after name after name. Why are we not talking about Chris Olave more in this group, in this tier? Because like, to me, like every athletic trait, he's got an extra gear to pull away in, in space, both with and without the football. Sudden athlete, everything has a snap to it. He sinks his hips really, really well in and out of breaks. He can play the ball in the air. He'll go up and fight for it. He snatches passes away from his frame. He can make plays after the catch. One of the best route runners that I've studied so far in this class, but he also has the athleticism and the burst to go with it. And that, to me, is what separates him from other guys is that, you know, we talked about, like, Rashad Bateman. Bateman doesn't have those athletic tools that, uh, that we've talked about with, you know, with Chris Olave. Uh, some of these other guys don't have the athletic gifts that Olave has. He is just so sudden, so explosive. Um, you know, to me, like, you look at guys like – even to me as a floor, as a floor for Chris Olave – like a Tyler Lockett, Stevie Johnson, like just guys that are just masterful route runners in the slot and also can line up outside. I feel like Olave, that can be his floor, and he's got the ability to be more than that. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this kid, having watched him last week. Yeah, I know. I, I, th I agree with everything you said. And it, it pained me to leave him out of my top five receivers uh, when, when I did my wide receiver preview. It was just – it was tough to do because – 
Okay, Jamar Chase, he's in there. Uh, Rondell Moore, I, I, I felt like he needed to be in there. Rashad Bateman, I felt needed to be in there. And then the two Alabama guys uh, with uh, Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith. So that's, that's five right there. And I, I, it, it really did pain me to leave Olavi out of there because I think I agree with everything you said. Um, he appeared in my first round mock that I did right after the draft ended. Uh, I think very highly of his talent. His route running is outstanding. He's just very silky smooth, those movements. Um, he, he is one of the best wide receiver talents in the, in the country, no doubt. I don't know if it's just the uh, the production share is so distributed in Ohio State the last like five years, but nobody seems to dominate the headlines as far as the skilled players in Columbus. This is another guy that's going to fall right into the second round and be a great NFL player. Second round picks that were Buckeyes, Michael Thomas, Curtis Samuel, Harris Campbell, J.K. Dobbins, Terry McLaurin's a third round pick. These are all great, great players that showed a lot on the field, just never really dominated the production chair, never really had those eye popping highlights, you know, make their way onto Sports Center. Just really good, you know, productive players that just never really wowed you. But he doesn't do anything that concerns me, Fran. There's a lot of great things in his game. I'm just trying to find concerns. You know, there's a little bit of a thin frame. I don't know if he has that long speed. But, again, I like that he has the burst speed, diverse route tree, the timing routes, intermediate routes, double moves, can set up defensive backs. He's a great downfield target. Only three drops on 91 targets. Yep. I mean, I wrote down Stevie Johnson just because I liked his release package, getting in and out of breaks, that kind of slender frame. He has a track background. I'm struggling to find things that I don't like about this kid, but I just keep grouping him with all those other kind of lukewarm stock Ohio State players that just don't get a lot of buzz. Uh, Dan, I know you wanted to stick with Ohio State here for your, uh, for your pick for this category. Yeah, and it's hard to go to Ohio State and be a sleeper, but Baron Browning, to me, qualifies. Uh, you know, you go back to that 2017 recruiting class for Ohio State, they signed five five stars in that group. Chase Young and Jeff Okuda were both top three picks last year. Sean Wade and Wyatt Davis, uh, who we've talked about both of them, I think they're going to end up as top 50, top 60 picks. The fifth one was Browning. Uh, they went down to Fort Worth, uh, Texas, and, and, and plucked him. Uh, brought him to Columbus, and you see the natural ability. 6'2", almost 240, uh, outstanding length. He runs really well. He smoothly accelerates. Uh, and you just see all the talent. He just hasn't put it all together yet. And so the play recognition isn't always there. Uh, you know, you want to see him get better mentally uh, in terms of de- sensing those developing run lanes, uh, you know, being able to uh, react before the climbing linemen get to him. Um, just recognizing play design. And so Baron Browning is ready to step up as a senior and be a, a better, much better player. It would not shock me at all if you tell me uh, next April he's the first senior linebacker drafted ahead of Chaz Surratt and some of these other guys that we've talked about. I think Man, he has that type of – Chaz Surratt. I like him. Oh, I like him. <laughs> he's good. He's uh, – I feel like every you know, week you gotta, sleep, you got to sneak that dig in there somewhere. No, I, I mean, Chaz Surratt's good. He is a, he's a day two player. Um, but I think Browning has the yeah. potential to, to pass him. I think he has that type of upside, that type of ceiling. It's just we need to see it. Um, and, you know, we'll see if another guy, you know, talk about Cole Van Lannon, who really needs that senior year. Baron Browning's in that discussion as well. Really needs that senior year uh, to prove that the ability is not – it's not only the ability, it's about, you know, the mentality that he has as, that he has as well. Sure. Uh, guys, for our most approved category, someone with, uh, you know, something to prove, uh, coming off an injury, scheme change, something that they just have to kind of validate for scouts moving forward into the NFL draft. Dane, you talked about your pick earlier, and that was Baron Browning's teammate, Sean Wade. You explained that uh, thoroughly. I'm going to get to mine here. Uh, Penn State tight end, Pat Fryermuth. And uh, Dane, you mentioned him last week as a guy that is certainly one of the top one or two tight ends in this class. To me, if he's going to be a first round pick, to me, the question he's got to answer is one of the things we've seen from a lot of Penn State players over the course of the last handful of years. If he goes out and blows up the combine, because if you look at the tight ends that have gone in round one in recent years, you know, TJ Hawkinson, uh, you know, his teammate Noah Fant, you go to the year where it was like Evan Ingram and, and those guys, that crew, David Njoku, uh, you know, the, OJ Howard, those guys ripped up the turf out there in Indianapolis. To me, when you look at Pat Fryermuth, 
this guy's a good blocker. Uh, I've talked with teammates who say, like, extra offensive lineman out there, no, no worries at all. He's like over 260 pounds. You know, at his size, very good at the point of attack. But also rock-solid hands. He's not, like, a great route runner yet. But of all the guys that have come out in the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years that have t- gotten that term, like, through draft Twitter of baby Gronk, like we said, I remember, like, Adam Shaheen was called baby. But, you know, it happens every single uh, couple, you know, every couple of years. Well, there's a tight end coming out. It's like, oh, yeah, this guy's the next Gronkowski. Friar Muth, to me, is the guy that most looks like it. I just want to see if he can back that up on the field or on the turf in Lucas Oil. Does he have that athleticism to kind of wow people and say, like, all right, this guy, we have to get this guy in round one? Because I think he checks all the other boxes. It's a, ma- it's a matter of is this guy capable of being, like, a mismatch athletically in space? Uh, Dane, I know you're, you're a big fan of Friar Muth. Yeah, I think he's he's got uh, really uh, really great ball skills. You know, the grip yep. hands. Um, but I think you know to your point, and this is really why. And I like Pat Fryermuth, but Kyle Pitts, the the Florida tight end, who I'm sure we'll talk about next week. Uh, he's the top tight end in the nation for me because of the athletic profile that he offers that Fryermuth doesn't have. He's not a bad athlete. It's just can he be a guy that separates? Can he be a guy that um, you know is going to be a somewhat of a threat? after the catch you know can he be a Mark Andrews type of tight end talent and I think he has a lot of ability um, but yeah I, I think that he uh, I, initially I was surprised that his name didn't come up in one of these earlier categories yep. but I think he does fit for for this uh, for this category in terms of most approved this year yeah and to me like it's a matter of you know like, again what is he going to do on the track that's not going to be a question for Ben's pick here, Rondell Moore, the wide receiver from Purdue. Yeah, he was going to be a true junior in 2020 after missing uh, all but four games last year with the hamstring injury. But 2018, let's go right to that conversation because I've written down best freshman receiver year ever. 114 catches, 1,200 yards, 12 touchdowns, another 21 rushing attempts, averaging 10.1 per attempt there. Really interesting player, but, you know, was hurt most of last year. Proved a lot that freshman year, hurt last year. I just want to see him stay healthy. And then what is his demeanor and production like when defenses are starting to key on him and they know he's the go-to guy? He's an interesting receiver at 5'9", 180. Thick lower half. He's built almost like a scat back. And we've seen guys the past couple of years, whether it's second-round pick, LaVishka Chenault last year, Debo Samuel the year before. He really fits that Randall Cobb, Dexter McCluster type of role where it looks like a running back playing out in the slot. But that's the nature of the NFL. You want to get the ball in his hands, the screen game, giving him yards after catch opportunities. He just looks like that perfect slot RPO receiver that Kyle Shanahan would turn into a thousand yard receiver. Like he was about to do at Debo Samuel last year on their way to the Super Bowl. A uh, really interesting player, good downfield blocking. The wide receiver coach really preaches the effort and the toughness downfield, really good hands can set up moves after the catch ASAP has 143 catches in his career. Only eight were downfield. And that's just like Debo. Debo ran 4-4, whatever, at the combine. He only caught three passes downfield for the the 49ers last year. This is the guy you want to get the ball in his hands ASAP the easiest way possible. Jets, handoffs, quick game, screens. I don't think he's this Tyreek Hill type of vertical presence that I I see some people projecting. A little bit more of the Debo Randall Cobb, in my opinion, but a really interesting player. I just want to see him stay healthy. And then what is his personality and play demeanor like when maybe he's starting to see some double teams and starting to see some specialized coverage, knowing that he's the guy in the offense? See, I think he can be that vertical weapon. I agree. Like, yeah. uh, he only averaged 11 and a half yards a catch. Like, that was like, that was uh, a very low number over the course of his career. And I think that plays to your point, Ben, that just in terms of his usage, <laughs> that he doesn't show that big playability consistently. But, man, like, especially if you go back to 2018, I never thought, even though he got hurt, like he was out for the year midseason, he didn't quite look as explosive as he did the year before. And I went back and I did some digging. It looked like there was a hamstring uh, injury in the summer as well. So I kind of wonder if that kind of hampered him out of the gate and then that, you know, everything kind of went downhill. After I'm almost that. giving him a pass for last year. I think I that, that summer injury lingered. He tried to give it a go in a couple games. Didn't look right. It's almost like I'm writing off that whole year. 
But then it's like, all right, he opted out. Am I just going off his true freshman season? I want to see it, what it's like when he's the guy on the offense. Everything I've heard about him off the field, and Dean, I don't know if you've talked with people in the program there, like no one has a bad thing to say about this kid in terms of like his work ethic, his love for the game, his passion. Even like there was a quote, um, hold on, let me see if I can find it. There was a quote from the, uh, from the freak list from 2019. There was uh, basically it was, a, it was a quote. Oh, here it is. So uh, apparently he called up David Blau, the, uh, the, the senior quarterback at the time for Purdue, at 1 a.m., asked him, hey, like, Hey, like I'm reading my playbook. Like, what do I run on this play? Like, what, what do you? How do you want me to run this? Right? You know. What I mean? So, like, just kind of speaking to like, uh, you know, like his work ethic and stuff like that. Like, everyone I've talked to, I've talked with a couple people inside that building, love Rondell Moore. Like, could not say more good things about him. So that gives me a lot, a lot of uh, confidence that he's going to be able to reach that ceiling. I think he could be, you know, oh, Tyree Kill. I hate comparing to Tyree Kill, but like. Brandon Cooks and what he's been able to do when he's been healthy, like Ooh, that's a good uh, one. Like yeah. screen game, vertical weapon. Uh, he can he can run a full route tree. He knows how to create separation. Like he's a fun player, man. One of the best yak players in college football for sure. I wrote down Steve Smith. You know, Carolina Panther, yep. Utah, similar right. height, weight, play style. Was also a vertical presence in combination with his physical underneath and yards after catch. So I think there is a you know, a projection where he can be that. I just have a, a couple more questions and maybe some other guys. Sure. I, I think that's fair because, yeah, we just haven't seen it. But, yeah, no, I, I agree, Fran. I, I think he can be that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of differences between him and then scouting Jalen Rager last year, uh, except Jalen Rager had more opportunities down the field. Uh, but I, I think it's more of an opportunity thing and not a he just he's not going to be able to do it consistently type of deal with, uh, with, with Rondell Moore. I, it, it's really going to be interesting. Uh, he's an interesting test case. It, it, uh, he barely played last year. He's not going to play this year. Uh, he's 5'9", buck 85. I mean, can you take a guy who we haven't really seen since his freshman year? And it was a – I mean, I, I agree with you, Ben. Best freshman year for a receiver we might have ever seen. But can you take a guy in the first round that hasn't played in basically two years who doesn't have the size? I it just He's a really interesting test case that's uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, you know, it's funny to mention Jalen Rieger because my issue with him is stop putting this little receiver outside the numbers going vertical all the time. Just make it easy for him. Put him tight to the formation. Throw him a quick game, a screen. He's electric with the ball in his hands. Why do you make it so hard to throw this little dot down the field? And I think that's kind of funny to mention that. I wish Jalen Rieger was used like a Rondell Moore. That's on you. All right, three, two. All right, guys, let's get to our, our next category here because you know, we still have some good players here to talk about. We'll talk about our newcomer on the scene, either a transfer or a replacement player stepping in for a guy that's now in the NFL. And that's how we're going to start this thing. Uh, Dame, we're going to come to you. The Ohio State Buckeyes lose J.K. Dobbins, but they've got a, a new look backfield with a guy that made some big plays from the last year and then another guy who uh, is transferring in as well. Yeah, Master Teague uh, is the guy that uh, he was the, the B back to J.K. Dobbins being the A back in that offense. Uh, more of a uh, between the tackles bruiser. Um, he's very physical. He runs hard. Um, I, not sure what type of athlete he is. He's not a bad athlete, but not sure he's has that dynamic ability to constantly make guys miss. It's just not his game. And it's going to be really interesting – adding Trey Sermon to this mix, uh, Oklahoma transfer who reminded me a lot of TJ Yeldon when he was coming, maybe not as dynamic, but in terms of uh, the size and what they offer, I see a lot of similarities there. I, Trey Sermon is one of the best screen running backs that I've scouted in the last few years uh, because of his vision, his quickness. Uh, he runs with some power. I uh, really like his patience. Uh, he makes fluid hard cuts, but he is really – quick at scanning the field and finding the best possible outcome. So runs a little too tall. I don't think he's, um, you know, a, as a between the uh, tackles type of runner, don't think he's going to make a lot of guys miss and, and really gash you that way. But you get him out in space, you make him part of the screen game. I think Trey Sermon uh, is a really interesting senior running back prospect. 
Yeah, I'm excited to see what this backfield looks like uh, for the Buckeyes this year. I'm going to go to the backfield as well, but on the defensive side of the football for the same team. And, uh, Ben, you mentioned Jordan Fuller earlier, four-year starter, I believe, for Ohio State, a uh, long time. But even though he had his limitations, like they just they trusted him on the back end, and he was consistent presence in the post. The guy that's going to step in for him, I believe, this year is Josh Proctor, 6'2", 205, um, you know, former big-time recruit uh, out of Oklahoma. And this kid is really, really intriguing because uh, not only does he have range to make plays sideline to sideline, but he's got really, really impressive uh, play recognition skills. He reads the quarterback's eyes really well from depth, um, showed the ability to jump routes in front of him, can track the deep ball and make plays outside the numbers from the post. He needs to get a little bit better in terms of uh, his consistency as a tackler. Too often, we'll try and just kind of lower his shoulder and block tackle instead of trying to wrap up. But I'll tell you what, at 6'2", the way that this kid moves from sideline to sideline, it would not shock me if we're talking about a guy that ascends into top 50, top 75 talk because uh, at that size, to move and make plays on the ball the way that he's able to, I think is pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, he's a, a guy that I'm certainly going to have my eye on on the back end of that secondary this year at Ohio State. Yeah, really fun player there, Fran. And uh, I guess it's time for the transfer segment of the show. I pre <laughs> would prefer if we had a little special interstitial noise or something to set up this segment. All right, we'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll talk to PK about it. Yeah, but really quick, uh, two notable ones that really caught my attention. Koi Kronk coming over from the University of Indiana going to the University of Iowa. Really experienced player, 40 starts, nearly 2,800 snaps at left tackle, likely going to hold down the right tackle spot opposite of Alaric Jackson, filling in for Tristan Wirfs off to the NFL. Also with Iowa, bringing in Jack Helfland, defensive tackle from Northern Iowa, interesting player. He was their defensive player of the year last year, a PFF All-American, uh, honorable mention All-American, so a guy that's gotten some uh, notoriety in the, in the media, good run pass player. Reminds me a little bit of Taven Bryan, kind of a country strong player. But the interesting segment is the University of Illinois and this absolute barrage on the transfer game that they've gone through the past two, three years, particularly the last calendar year, bringing over guys like Luke Ford from Georgia, the immature baby kid uh, from USC. Now his brother, the tight end coming from over USC. You got Trayvon Sidney from USC, Brian Hightower from Miami, the kid from Mizzou, the receiver. They just got FCS All-American center. Uh, what's the kid's name from Wofford? Blake Gerasati. They have a couple of defensive backs from Louisville and Miami, a linebacker from Washington. Their quarterbacks from Michigan. Their entire roster is built by other guys around the country. They brought over Roderick Perry from South Carolina State that was getting a lot of buzz. I don't know what they're doing with the high school recruiting, but they are going after the transfer portal and a lot of talent. I don't know if they're going to be able to all gel together, but just browse that roster if you're ever bored and look at where all these guys have come from. A lot of interesting uh, backgrounds. Uh, Lovey Smith playing the, uh, the free agency game uh, for sure out in Illinois. Um, all right, guys, this is our last category here. Future stud. This is a player not eligible for 2021, but someone that we need to watch for the future. Dane, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, we talked about Chris Olave for the Buckeyes, a talented wide receiver. Uh, their number two receiver is uh, a guy that would be the number one at most other places, Garrett Wilson, a five-star out of uh, Austin, Lake Travis High School. Uh, not the biggest guy, only about six foot, maybe, you know, buck 80, buck 85. But his body control, his adjustment skills, uh, he just, you know, he looked like he was born to play the receiver position. A lot of fun. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he ends up leading the Buckeyes in, in receiving this year. I think him and Justin Fields have a natural connection. So it's going to be a lot of fun watching Fields uh, and Olave. And I, I think Ohio State's got two pretty good tight ends that unfortunately we didn't get to talk about here. Uh, but Garrett Wilson's right in that mix. Uh, someone we'll be talking about a lot for the 2022 NFL draft. So I'm going to stay uh, at the wide receiver position. I'm going to go with uh, Rondell Moore's old teammate, David Bell, who really kind of took the mantle uh, for the Boilermakers in the passing game last year when Rondell Moore uh, bowed out with injury. 86 catches, led the Big Ten last year, over 1,000 yards, seven touchdowns. This guy was a big play machine for Purdue. Certainly a name that we are going to be keeping an eye on, keeping an eye on here moving forward, made a lot of big plays last year uh, for the Boilermakers, but also just very consistent, had a number of catches in each and every game, uh, really came on in the second half of the season as well. Ben, uh, round us out here. 
There's a lot of young explosive receivers in this conference. I'm glad you mentioned Bell. Uh, kid for Indiana is really impressive. There's some young guys. Giles Jackson out in Michigan is a fun player. But Ohio State, you know they have some studs behind Chase Young that uh, didn't get an opportunity to see the field a whole lot. Zach Harrison leads the show. Only played at 280 snaps last year. Rotational player. This was the number one defensive end at a high school. Five star. Is running official 4-4-7-40. Official 4-4-7-40 at 6 Six two sixty five. This kid is an absolute freak show athlete, explosive player, just a little young and stuck behind the uh, number one overall pick, Chase Young, or excuse me, number two overall pick, Chase Young in last year's NFL draft. So a guy, once he sees the field a little more consistently with some of those other young Ohio State guys like Tyreek Smith and Jonathan Cooper, it's a new era on the defensive line there with uh, Chase Young and um, Hamilton off to the NFL. So really excited for his future. Guys, we, uh, we covered a lot of players this week. We covered a lot of players last week, ACC, week before the Pac-12. We round it out next week. Our final conference preview with the SEC next week. We're going to be covering right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA fellas. We'll talk to you then. Great stuff from Dane. Great stuff from Ben. Make sure you join us next week here. As I said, we're going to be breaking down the SEC. We'll see if we have a little bit more information on the outlook of the 2020 season at that point. But Look, we're, we're going to uh, just keep riding along here, talking about these top players, talking about their outlook, uh, their future for the NFL. As, ro- as news keeps pumping out, we'll keep rolling with the punches here on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Just a quick reminder, as we get, kind of gear up for the start of the NFL season where football is going to be played, just give us a if you like this if you like the podcast throw us your support go on to apple Podcasts, stitcher wherever you listen leave us a rating leave us a comment it's the best way to kind of throw throw us your support here uh, as college football hopefully in some way shape or form does inch closer i should say that it looks like a couple of these conferences are going to try and give it a go at least to start the season so uh, we will have some form of college football this fall but uh, with each passing day, as other other conferences and other players drop out, uh, the, the hopes grow sl- slimmer and slimmer. But look, like I said, we'll keep rolling with the punches. Thanks so much for joining us once again here on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA.